Hello, everybody. It's 7 o'clock. Welcome to Zoom to Gettysburg, a program designed as a friendly informational discussion with LBGs, historians, authors, and guests. Program leaders and moderators require polite and courteous behavior of all participants. LBG and invited presenters will make every effort to provide accurate historical information. However, information provided and group discussion may be subject to different interpretations. Information shared does not guarantee passing or successful completion of any test, exam, class, and or course, including, but not limited to, the NPS Licensed Battlefield Guide Test. We reserve the right to limit discussions and comments during the programs. Program is recorded and not published. By attending, you give your permission to be recorded and potentially be published in the future. With that, I'd like to turn it over um, to one of our uh, Zoom presenters. Jim, this is what, the, the fourth or fifth time, I think, here. Uh, hold, hold that thought. I'm going to talk about that. Oh, okay. So uh, with all that, uh, Jim, I want to make sure you can share the screen. And once you get it, and um, I'll shut down and make sure we can all hear you. Have a good show. Talk to you after. All right. Thanks, Fran. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for uh, having me again. Give me a second to share my screen and we'll get started. Get my slideshow going. Yep, I see your slideshow and I can hear you. Yes. There we go. All right, Jim, I can hear you. Have a good time. All right. Thanks, everybody. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Fran. Thanks to the uh, 763 team for having me today. Um, as we've advertised, I'm going to talk about uh, a topic that is obviously related to my work, you know, with Sickles and the Third Corps, uh, but it's, it's not a topic that I get to deep dive on a lot. So I'm kind of looking forward to uh, doing this. Hopefully in my enthusiasm, I'm not gonna fire hose you guys with too much information because uh, I do always try to pride myself on finishing on time and not going too long. Uh, but you'll see my cover slide here, which I've self-titled uh, a rainbow over Humphreys with an image by our very own Phil Spoggy, who I believe is in attendance tonight. Now though, before we get started to answer Fran's question, this is my fifth time presenting or co-presenting uh, here at 763. And as I was putting this together, uh, this reminded me of the old Saturday Night Live gag, remember where they had the five timers club for uh, anybody who gets to uh, host five times or more. So, you know, it got me thinking, Fran, you know, we do this without compensation. It puts a lot of time, you know, it takes a lot of time to put this stuff together. Maybe is a time that we started thinking about some 763 smoking jackets uh, you know, maybe some fine leather chairs for the uh, for the five time presenters. Um, I don't know who else has presented five times, but uh, you know, I imagine Chris and Jerry and uh, Phil and maybe some of those other guys are here. So uh, we can kind of imagine that this is what the seven six three guide room might look like. Uh, I feel like I'm like Tom Hanks here in this photo. Uh, this could be Fran waiting on me. You know, I see Chris and Jerry over here, kind of uh, uh, kind of talking things over. So I'm thinking this is kind of what we we should uh, set up for the uh, for the five timers club at uh, at seven six three. So yeah, I've done the uh, Peach Orchard with Brit. I did Pickett's Charge with Wayne, East Cavalry Field, Sickles Murder Trial, and now I'm going to do Humphreys in the Emmitsburg Road tonight. Um, and all joking aside, though, I am proud of the fact that four out of the five topics that I've brought to this group have been battlefield and combat related, because uh, at the end of the day, damn it, you know, we're battlefield guides and, and, and this is what we do. So having said that, you know, the standard Humphreys tour, you know, on the two hour car tour often goes something like this. Um, you know, you stand at the peach orchard, you talk about Sickles' right flank, you kind of point dramatically down the Emmitsburg Road, you talk about Sickles' right flank ended along the Emmitsburg Road after breaking the position at the peach orchard, Confederates drove Union forces from the Emmitsburg Road back towards Cemetery Ridge, you know, you point dramatically in that direction towards Cemetery Ridge. And, you know, very often that's the only coverage that Humphreys and his guys get on the uh, typical battlefield tour. And it's, um, you know, it's no fault of ours. It's no fault of the battlefield guides. Uh, but the simple fact is the auto tour route is not conducive to covering this part of the field unless you really make an effort to do it. So we're going to do make an effort to do it tonight via PowerPoint, and I'm going to try to bring you Humphreys and bring you to the, that part of the field uh, the best I can. 
Now, Andrew Atkinson Humphreys, uh, you know, has always been a little bit of a conundrum to me. Um, I, you know, I like to figure out what people did, but I also like to figure out and under, try to understand the best we can what type of people these guys were. What were they like? Uh, and, you know, Humphreys has always been, I think, a little bit of a puzzle because I think there's some contradictions here. Um, you know, you will see that, hold on, I'm closing a window here, hold on. Um, you'll see Humphreys was born in 1810, Philadelphia native, like George Mead, which I think is no coincidence. Uh, Humphreys was 52 years old at the Battle of Gettysburg, which would make him on the, on the older side of the uh, spectrum. Uh, he was an 1831 West Point graduate, uh, which makes him unique within the high command of the Third Corps, uh, as many of us know, Sickles, the, the political general, and many of the top subordinates all came out of politics and besides Humphreys, none of the leader, senior leaders of the Third Corps had had that military education and background. Uh, Humphreys is from a noted family. His grandfather and, and father were noted uh, Navy designers and architects. Like a lot of these guys, Humphreys had really little combat experience prior to the Civil War and certainly no experience leading large bodies of men. Uh, his first assignments were in artillery uh, against the Seminole Indians. He briefly resigned from the Army in 1836. For a while, he worked in civilian life as a lighthouse engineer. Again, another thing he has in common with George Meade uh, before returning in 1838 and was appointed to the Corps of Topographical Engineers. And this is one of the contradictions that you see with Humphreys. You know, not only is he a military guy, and as we'll see tonight, a fighter, uh, but he's a science man. He's a man of science. Um, and I don't know if I saw Jerry Han. I don't know if Jerry's on the Zoom tonight or not, but, you know, I feel like, oh, yeah, I guess maybe he is. But anyways, Jerry, a resident scientist, uh, maybe maybe can feel a little bit of a connection to, uh, uh, to Humphreys. Uh, but despite the expertise in these scientific disciplines, Humphreys insisted anyone who knows me knows that I had more of the soldier than a man of science in me. Now, Humphrey's first real experience leading large bodies of troops came at Fredericksburg. Uh, he had a division in the fifth Corps, and he led one of the last of the massive but futile assaults against Marie's Heights. Uh, and his 5,000 man division suffered more than a thousand casualties during that assault. If I can tell a personal story, and it's one of the reasons why this guy kind of interests me, Many years, well, several years ago, some friends and I uh, hired a guide, a very noted historian, to take a tour of the Fredericksburg battlefield. And um, uh, I won't say who that historian's name was. I won't say that it was Frank O'Reilly. I won't say that. But we took a, a tour of the Fredericksburg battlefield. And at the end of the day, this note, we got to Maurice Heights. And I was so excited, you know, because that's one of my favorite parts of the battle. And I said to noted historian, I said, well, is this where Humphreys charged? You know, show me where Humphreys was. And the noted Fredericksburg historian lit into Humphreys, said Humphreys was like, I, you know, I think the actual phrase was Humphreys was the worst general in the Union Army. The guy was an idiot. There's a story about, you know, Humphreys is in action and one of the, his brigades start cheering him and Humphreys kind of waves and rides off. And according to the historian, the men were laughing at Humphreys because they thought he was such a buffoon and Humphreys didn't really get it. And I got to tell you, as a Gettysburg person, like most of you are, I was crestfallen. I had always been trained to think of Humphreys as, you know, a superhero, you know, one of the stars of the of the Union Army. And to hear another historian talk about Humphreys like this, I was I was devastated. I ran home that night. I tore all my Humphreys posters off my bedroom wall, uh, cried myself to sleep. It was terrible. But it reminded me, we tend to look at these guys through the spectrum of one battle. And we tend to do it as Gettysburg people. And as you can see elsewhere, uh, they tend to do it as you know Fredericksburg people. So I thought that was kind of an interesting experience. Now, one of the character traits about Humphreys, even though you wouldn't really know it by looking at him, uh, is he was considered one of the loudest swearers uh, in the Army of the Potomac and a man of distinguished and brilliant profanity. Uh, 
I kind of wondered, you know, how true was this? It's that one quote we always use was, is that overplayed? But in doing my Humphreys research over the years, I did find other references to this. Uh, a mother of a soldier once wrote to him and said, you know, you are a stranger to me, but I hear you spoken as a gentleman, but a profane swearer. I must say that no man is fit to command that can't command his own tongue. And Humphreys replied to the woman and he replied in the third person, he said, it is true General Humphreys swears at his fellow man, never at the Almighty, even when carried away by an irresistible burst of passion. So again, I think you, you, know, you wouldn't necessarily know it by looking at the images of this guy. Uh, seems that you know seems to be pretty foul mouthed and would hold his own with guys like Hancock and some of these old other old army regulars. Now, as I said before, he was in the Fifth Corps, but after Chancellorsville, he received command of the Second Division of the Third Corps as a replacement for Hiram Berry, who was killed at Chancellorsville. Now, you might be thinking, uh oh, Humphreys, the professional soldier going under sickles. What's this going to be like? But at the time, Humphreys seems to have been happy with the new assignment. He considered his new division one of the best in the whole army, and he seems to have been uh, excited by the challenge. George Meade, however, was sorry to lose his friend from the Fifth Corps, whom he considered a most valuable officer, an associate of the most agreeable character kind of thing. And I'm going to come back a little bit to the meade Humphreys dynamic uh, later on. And um, despite all this, Humphreys continuously expressed his desire to command troops over serving in any sort of staff capacity. As many of us know, when his friend George Meade takes command of the Army of the Potomac, again, it's no coincidence that Humphreys is, you know, maybe the first person that Meade goes to asks to replace Butterfield as chief of staff. And Humphreys doesn't really decline the offer, but in Humphreys' mind, he defers the offer until at least after the, the, uh, the next major battle. Because I think Humphreys just wants to go out and kick some ass. So that's kind of that. Now, when I was doing research for my Sickles book, um, one of the things I did was I came across the uh, papers at Carlisle of David Burney, who commands the other division in Sickles' Third Corps. And Burney had some very interesting comments on Humphreys. Um, Burney sarcastically referred to, he kind of lumped Meade, Humphreys, and Warren together. He called them, you know, he referred to them as the do-nothing engineer clique. Um, so obviously, Bernie did not have any great uh, uh, affection for these West Point engineers. But he also described Humphreys as continuously washing himself and putting on paper dickies. Uh, Bernie added that Humphreys was what we call an old granny, a charming, clever gentleman, fussy. Now, again, that kind of went against my perception of Humphreys. I always kind of imagined Humphreys as kind of this bandana wearing, you know, shirtless Rambo type of guy, you know, who's hitting the Confederates with a rifle musket in each hand, you know, like Rambo might have sort of thing. So I thought it was kind of interesting, uh, you know, to see him referred to as a clever, fussy gentleman who's always washing himself. Again, I, that to me is part of the, the contradictions that I see in this, in this Humphreys character. So as I talked about before, there's a dynamic in the Third Corps Bernie is a Sickles ally. The newly appointed Humphreys is clearly a Meade ally. And you already have coming into Gettysburg kind of a break between Sickles and Meade that goes back several months. Um, so, you know, you have, you have commanding Sickles' second division, a crony of George Meade's. I mean, I hate to use the word crony, but you know what I'm saying. And you can kind of wonder what Sickles and his cronies might have kind of thought about that. But the other thing, too, that I'll point out is Bernie was promoted to major general after Chancellorsville, uh, while Humphreys was still a brigadier general to date from 1862. And I point this out because, you know, during the various snafus and screw ups that occur on the battlefield on July 2nd, Many, many, many times over the years, I've heard people say stuff like, well, why didn't Sickles take advice from, from Humphreys? And why doesn't Sickles give command of the Corps to Humphreys and things of that nature? And the simple answer is Bernie outranks him. So, you know, Bernie, not Humphreys, is Sickles' go-to guy. Uh, and we'll come back to that as well 
later in the presentation. So, okay, so we have this thing about um, uh, Bernie, you know, saying that Humphreys is always putting on these paper dickies. You know, paper dickie is a false collar in case anybody doesn't know what that is. And you think, okay, so what? What does that have to do with the Battle of Gettysburg? Well, it doesn't really have anything to do with the Battle of Gettysburg, but like I said, it does give us insight into these people and what they're like. And what do you know, now that every time I look at a Humphreys photo uh, with sort of his new lens of paper dickies, I noticed, sure enough, this dude has a white false collar on in like every photo of him you ever see. <laughs> okay, well, so what? The guy likes to look good with his white collar, but maybe then that tells us that some of Bernie's other observations uh, were accurate about his character as, as well. So again, just sort of a little bit of insight there, perhaps. Okay, let's talk about Humphrey's strength as we go right into Gettysburg. So commanding the second division of the third corps, Humphreys has on paper what would seem to be a good sized division, 4,924 men. We got three brigades, Brigadier General Joseph Carr, 1,700 men, Colonel William Brewster, 1,800 men, and the third brigade under Colonel George Burling, 13, 1,400 men. Now, after the Battle of Gettysburg, Humphreys left sort of a well-known complaint where he wrote afterwards, had my division been left intact, it would have driven the enemy back. But this ruinous habit, it don't deserve the name of system, of putting troops in position and then drawing off its reserves and second lines to help others who, if similarly disposed, would need no such help, is disgusting. And that was Bernie complaining about, I'm sorry, Humphreys, that was Humphreys complaining about how his division was used at the Battle of Gettysburg. So is there any merit to that complaint? Well, we go from 4,924 men, and then we look at how his division is used on the afternoon of July 2nd, and this is what you see. His effective division gets his basically gets reduced by 36% uh, as men are parsed out onto different parts of the field, primarily to support General Bernie. So we go from 4,900 men to about 3,100, and here's what we're kind of looking at. Carr, the 1st Brigade, drops to 1,400 men. He's got the 84th Pennsylvania de detached guarding corps trains. Well, okay, I guess somebody has to do that. Uh, but in the 2nd Brigade under Brewster, Brewster loses the 73rd New York when they're sent later to support Bernie and Graham near the Peach Orchard, and as probably most of you know, the most egregious detachment of all, George Burling, basically Burling's entire brigade, uh, with the exception of the 5th New Jersey, also gets parsed out all over the field to uh, support Bernie. So, you know, when you add it up, there does seem to be some merit to Humphrey's legendary complaint that his guys were thrown all over the field, and in effect, you know, that his division had been weakened. Now, on the plus side, he does get some artillery support. He will get Sealy's uh, Battery of Napoleons from the 3rd Corps Artillery Brigade, and he will also get Turnbull's Battery, again, of Napoleons from the Army Reserve. So ultimately, Humphreys will have to defend his front with about 12 pieces of artillery, which again might seem okay, but go back and think about how much artillery they give Bernie. Right, they give Bernie like forty or fifty artillery pieces on the left. So, if I were Humphreys, uh, I might have something to kind of gripe about here a little bit too, as as he does. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit just about Humphreys' top subordinates, Brigadier General Joseph Carr and Colonel William Brewster, because the the action that we're talking about tonight will primarily include. Uh, their two brigades. So I'm not going to talk about Burling. As I've said, as probably many of you know, Burling is detached and parsed out onto other parts of the battlefield. Uh, but Brigadier General Joseph Carr and Colonel William Brewster. Uh, Carr in particular, I'm just going to spend a minute with, um, again, just because I find him kind of interesting and there's some interesting anecdotes uh, attached to him. And, you know, be honest, my friends and colleagues, be honest. When was the last time you talked about Brigadier General Joseph Carr on a battlefield tour? You know, I know when I'm doing the Sickles thing I do, but on the two hour car tour, Carr isn't one of the three or four names we throw at people, you know? So 
Um, Carr was a New York native. He was a, a family of Irish immigrants, 34 years old at the uh, Battle of Gettysburg, tobacco merchant by trade. He had allegedly worked one time as a dance master, which is going to kind of come back to uh, haunt him a little bit. But he raised uh, second New York in 1861 and briefly served under George Willard. And just nothing else, a little bit of trivia there. Newspapers touted Carr as kind of the model colonel. Uh, he commanded brigades during the Seven Days, during Bull Run, temporarily led the division at Chancellorsville after Hiram Berry fell. Um, now, one interesting thing, he his promotion to Brigadier General was put in in September of 62. But the Senate did not confirm his promotion until 1864. And when they did, they backdated it to March of 63. So, you know, kind of technically, Brigadier General Carr was kind of still a colonel at, um, at Gettysburg. But you never see that. You never see colonel on any of the uh, orders of battle. And, you know, I'll continue to refer to him as General Carr as well. Now, getting back to the dancing school thing, um, there's an interesting quote from an officer in the 11th Massachusetts by the name of Lieutenant and then later Captain Henry Blake. And Blake, who just had your withering New England sort of sarcastic personality, uh, repeatedly referred to in his memoirs about the cowardice of a certain general and uh, that this general taught, taught dancing at schools of low character prior to the war and that men would allegedly razz this guy by shouting promenade the bar and things like that when he rode by uh, and that it's okay to be in front because while we're in his brigade, you know, there won't be any fighting you know, kind of thing. We don't really know that Blake's anecdotes uh, refer to Carr, but sort of by process of elimination, we kind of think it does, uh, which obviously is not a very flattering uh, portrayal of the man. Uh, the other thing too is um, for Carr, one man wrote that a profane or objectionable word was never heard from his lips. And again, going back to my earlier premise of trying to understand what these people are like, go read Carr's official report sometime, and he uses the word coupe de solil in his report. And I had to look that up. I'm like, what the hell does coupe de solil mean? I looked it up. It's a reference to sunstroke. So again, the guy seems to, again, sort of play out the perception that maybe he's got a little bit of a, a flowery personality or vocabulary a little bit. Next time you're hot on the tour, use Coupe de Soleil and see how many people are talking about. And I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, by the way, before I move on, this is not the last time we'll hear from Henry Blake tonight. And I'll just give a shout out to MASH fans. Uh, if any of you are fans of MASH, you may have heard this said before. But in and around this area, we have a major Burns in the 73rd New York. Uh, we have a Pierce in the 3rd Michigan, and we have Henry Blake in the 11th Massachusetts. So there you go if you're, if you're into the TV show, MASH. The other thing, though, interesting uh, trivia about Carr, he is the great, great, great grandfather of actress Laura Prepon. And I have no idea if I'm saying her last name correctly either. But uh, the girl from that 70s show, Carr is her, his great, great, great grandfather. And I want to call out Jerry Hahn. Jerry was the one who several years ago when he was doing his factoids via email, Jerry was the one who taught me this fact. So I want to give Jerry a, uh, a shout out there. And, you know, whether or not you're a fan of that 70s show, I'm not really a fan of it that much. But this factoid has a uh, notable sentimental value for me because it was th this factoid is the only Civil War anecdote that has ever impressed my daughter. So, you know, because of that, I kind of had this kind of warms my heart to uh, think about this, too. And I'm guessing, too, maybe this is the first time a Hollywood starlet has attended uh, 763. So I don't know. OK, so that's General Carr. He's in the front line along the Emmitsburg Road, which is why I'm giving him a little bit of emphasis as well. So let's move the troops forward. Um, you'll see on the map here, I've kind of highlighted Carr's brigade along the front line of the Emmitsburg Road, and then you'll see Brewster's brigade kind of moving into position behind him. Uh, probably sometime around 11 in the morning, the 1st Massachusetts moved to the skirmish line under Lieutenant Colonel Clark Baldwin. Uh, activity seemed to pick up. There was uh, some notable skirmishing going on. 
At about one o'clock, mid to early afternoon, I think for the most part, Carr and Brewster were kind of about 300 yards or so uh, east of the Emmitsburg Road. I think at that time they were kind of massed in columns, kind of, kind of in the vicinity next to the Trussell farm, kind of just to give you a general idea there. Um, they talk about several moves being made during the course of the day. And I think uh, that's one of them. Uh, but things really start to hit the fan, you know, in mid afternoon, as we approach four o'clock, uh, Burling gets sent over to Bernie, uh, the 73rd New York for a while is going to move forward to the Daniel Klingel house. And they're told to kind of hold the, the ridge and the road at all hazards. But at about four o'clock, Humphreys gets ordered by Sickles to move en masse to the Emmitsburg Road. Uh, and you can see him on the map there. We're talking the 26th PA on the right flank, the 11th mass, the 16th mass, 12th New Hampshire. And then on the other side of the Klingle Farm is the, um, is the 11th New Jersey. Uh, as we said, as I said before, we also get some support from Sealy's artillery battery. Originally, they are in a position north of the Klingle House. They then get moved to south of the Klingle House, closer to where their monument is today. Uh, we detach some guys to go fight into the Klingle House itself. And because Carr did not have enough men to cover his entire front, which specifically would be to connect Carr's left with Graham's right. So you can see the 11th New Jersey is Carr's left, 105th PA, Graham's right. Because we've got a break in between those two uh, brigades, some of Burling's brigades, a couple regiments of the Excelsior are moved up in here for a little while at least to close the gap while the rest of the Excelsior brigade is at least for a while held in reserve. Now, how does Humphreys describe the big move forward? Um, well, there's two things I wanna highlight here. And again, the first one on the top left goes back to my earlier comment. You know, people often say to me, why isn't, you know, Sickles consulting with Humphreys? Humphreys is the only West Pointer he's got. Uh, and the short answer is, they're not talking to each other. Uh, Humphreys would later say, I did not see General Sickles in the morning. I could not leave my division unless sent for. Remember, guys, this is the Army. You don't just go riding around, you know, keep talking to your superior officers unless you're asked for. Uh, I could not leave my division unless sent for. I had no general knowledge of the position of the troops except what I could see on my right, which would be Hancock. The ground on my left, which would be Bernie, was hidden by trees. So he says the terrain, he just couldn't couldn't see what what uh, what Bernie was doing over there. But going back to the move, he says, a little after four o'clock, I received orders from General Sickles to move near the Emmitsburg Road. I was also authorized to call on General Hunt for more artillery. Um, again, we've got Sealy's battery. I immediately moved my command forward, placing Carr's brigade up to the Emmitsburg Road. I sent an aide to camp to General Sickles and asked whether I should attack the enemy. And I received from an answer, no. I was to remain where I was. So clearly Sickles is thinking some sort of hold the road, defensive posture sort of thing, don't attack the enemy. Like how crazy is that? You know, we're used to thinking of Sickles as the aggressive guy. And here we got one of, his, one of his subordinates going to him and saying, hey, can I attack? And Sickles is saying no. So again, maybe another myth shattered a little bit. Okay, modern views of the battlefield. So, you know, if you go out towards uh, Sickles Avenue, kind of below the Klingle Farm, and this is the Klingle House in the barn, kind of on the right of this top image. Obviously, the Amitsburg Road, uh, as it is today and as it was then, presents a very dominating image. You can't, if you're east, if you're on the east side of the Amitsburg Road Ridge, you can't see on the other side of the road. I mean, the ground drops off rather quickly. So obviously any troops positioned down below here are going to have absolutely no field of fire whatsoever. So it's clearly going to make sense to push your men up to the top of the ridge towards the road, get your batteries up there, and push your skirmishers even as far forward to the west side of the Emmitsburg Road, which is what you're looking at in the bottom picture. So look at how the view changes just because this Emmitsburg Road ridge is, you know, blocking the view and look at the sight line that you see, um, you know, looking to the west. And this is a neat image too. Um, it goes back to 
1890s. And this is the Emmitsburg Road basically running through the center of the picture. Uh, the camera at this point is facing south. So the town of Gettysburg would be behind the camera in this image. So what you're looking at is on the left side of the image is the Klingel property. On the right side of the image would probably be, I think, the post-war Rogers property. We'll give you an idea where the Rogers, uh, you know, buildings were at the time of the battle. So what you would have seen in 1863 is basically uh, cars, most of the cars front would have occupied a good portion of the Emmitsburg Road on the left side of this picture. Uh, cars right flank would end, would be in the air somewhere about near the left side of this picture. And then later on in the day, the Confederates would advance from the right of the image, past the Rogers property, across the Emmitsburg Road, and hit Humphrey's men, you know, in the general area uh, of the Emmitsburg Road. So I think this is a pretty cool picture. Also, obviously, gives you an idea of, you know, really what a piece of crap the Emmitsburg Road was uh, in terms of how rotted it was, and you know, at the at, in those days. So I think that's kind of a cool picture. Okay, so our fighting tonight. Uh, is basically going to take place after the Peach Orchard. You know, very often we do the fighting at the Peach Orchard, and then we just kind of wrap up Humphrey's part of the fight in a sentence or two. But tonight we're going to do the opposite. Peach Orchard fighting is uh, basically coming to a head, and what you can see on the map is Barksdale's three, re three of Barksdale's four regiments pushing through the peach orchard, heading sort of diagonally um, across the peach orchard, across the Sherfy and the Wentz property, and toward the Trussell Farm Lane, modern United States Avenue. Now, initially, things were kind of quiet along Humphrey's front, and that was one of the reasons why they uh, thought it was going to be okay to allow Bernie to draw off of him for reinforcements. Uh, but sometime around 6 o'clock, when the Peach Orchard was falling apart, another calamity happened within the Union Army command structure, and of course, I am referring to the wounding of General Dan Sickles. Uh, but Sickles was wounded by an artillery shell at the Trussell Barn, which is also on our map right now. And when Sickles was wounded, he turned over command of the Third Corps to, not Humphreys, but General Bernie. As I said before, Bernie outranked Humphreys. So Humphreys uh, pretty immediately gets orders from Bernie to throw back his left, throw back the left of his division. And according to Bernie, we're going to connect Bernie's right and Humphreys left, form an oblique line and basically fall back towards what they refer to later as the Round Top Ridge. Humphreys, being the good soldier that he is, and not being heavily engaged by that point, is able to pull back his left, as you can see on the map, and guess what? Bernie has no right. Bernie's line has fallen to pieces at the Peach Orchard, at the Wheat Field, and places like that. And so and then Humphreys, as he's fallen back here, doesn't have anything to connect his left to. Um, so, you know, that's that's going to be a problem, obviously, in the defense here. And is, so what you're going to see is he's swinging back the Excelsior Brigade, the regiments of Brewster's brigades. Carr is still along the Emmitsburg Road, and you'll see right here kind of playing almost like a hinge, so to speak, is the 11th New Jersey. They're kind of bending back a little bit and connecting uh, these two sides. Obviously, you can imagine Humphreys pretty pissed off that he doesn't have anything to connect with on Bernie's side. Humphreys later bitterly characterized Bernie's order as Bosch. And I don't know if I've seen Guillermo Bosch here tonight, which is a shame because I was kind of hoping to use that line on him. Uh, but Bosch, you know, is kind of how how he characterized the uh, the order to do this. But this is now really going to characterize Humphrey's alignment, his defense, and his fight along the Emmitsburg Road. And while he's doing this, Confederate brigades under Cadmus Wilcox and the Floridians under Lang are going to advance. Uh, so this is an image of Cadmus Wilcox, born in 1824. He was also a West Point graduate. Uh, his nervous excitement when going into action had led to his men dubbing him Old Billy Fixin, which I don't know, I think that's one of the funnier uh, Battle of Gettysburg nicknames, you know, kind of right up there with Clawhammer Witcher. We've got Old Billy Fixin. 
fixing Wilcox. Um, his attire also created a less than dashing impression. He supposedly favored short jackets and straw hats over more of the, uh, uh, you know, the standard regulation issue. And the belief on Wilcox has always been that he reportedly felt slighted and overlooked for promotion to division command, uh, especially after guys like George Pickett, you know, had gotten promoted to division command. So it's definitely possible that old Billy Fixon, who's got good experience, uh, but maybe, you know, just got sort of like a nervous temperament or something that hasn't quite caught Robert E. Lee's eye yet. Uh, but it's quite possible that old Billy Fixon Wilcox is maybe fighting the battle of Gettysburg a little bit with a chip on his shoulder. So what does he say? Wilcox says that at about 6.20 in the evening, when McLaws, McLaws's uh, troops had advanced to the attack, that my instructions were to advance when the troops on my right should advance. Now, his right is kind of overlapping Barksdale's left, so he's got to move off by the left flank um, and then kind of face by the right flank to advance. Wilcox talks about this forward movement was made in an open field, the ground rising to the Emmitsburg Turnpike. Before reaching this road, a line of the enemy's skirmishers along a fence parallel to the road were encountered and dispersed. So he talks about hitting the federal skirmish line, kind of dispersing them. Uh, the fence being crossed by men advanced to the road in which the enemy's infantry were formed in line of battle. So now you've got Wilcox moving forward. And on his left, you're going to have about another 700 men again, as I've said, in Lang's uh, Florida Brigade. So now you've got these two brigades coming towards the Emmitsburg Road uh, to, hit, to hit the front of uh, Humphrey's line. Now, as far as timing, uh, Humphreys insisted that Wilcox's attack was nearly simultaneous with that of Barksdale on Humphreys left, um, perhaps owing a little bit to the swinging back, preceding it a little bit. But if Humphreys' recollection was correct, what this kind of tells us is that, you know, both sides of this line both sides of this line that I showed you on this map are about to get hammered at the uh, at the same time. And it's noteworthy, too, because the, some of the Excelsiors would later complain that while they thought they were in trouble, uh, Carr's guys just stood there and did nothing. And you see that in a couple of occasional accounts, but what the Excelsiors wouldn't have realized was that you had, you know, uh, Carr's guys had their own problems coming at them. So, all right, let's look at numbers a little bit. So I told you before, you know, on paper at this point, Humphreys is probably looking at about 3,100 men. Um, you know, it's hard to tell what the Confederate numbers would be. I'm going to guesstimate for tonight's exercise, we're talking about 3,500 Confederates, and that's going around the clock here. That's Lang's Brigade coming in against Carr's right center with about 700 men. Wilcox has got, give or take, about 1,700 men. And then those three brigades of Barksdale that I referred to before, on paper, they've got about 1,150 men. Clearly, they've taken some casualties going through the Sherfy property, but we don't know what that number is. So, um, you know, give or take 3,500 men on the Confederate side. You want to deduct plus or minus on either side, uh, be my guest. What it tells me what it tells me is that neither side has a really overwhelming advantage against the other side. The numbers are roughly equal. So I think it's going to kind of be up to positioning. And, you know, we've talked again about Carr's flanks being in the air. I'm trying to get my cursor over there. We've talked a little bit about Carr's flanks being in the air. Uh, it'll also come down to artillery support. It will come down to, I think, leadership uh, and, you know, a little bit of the terrain and one of the things I will say, if you've ever stood basically at the Klingel property or on top of the Emmitsburg Road Ridge, uh, you've got no cover and concealment over there. I mean, I told you before, you kind of have to get to the top of the ridge. You kind of have to get to the Emmitsburg Road uh, to see what's on the other side. But once you get up there, I mean, you stick out like a sore thumb and there isn't really a lot of cover and concealment up there. So part of me wonders if that is going to play a part in what happens as well. So this is uh, Wilcox's brigade advancing. We see the image on the top left. The camera is 
at the Emmitsburg Road, roughly looking towards the Henry Spangler farm. And Wilcox's brigade would have advanced out of these woods towards the camera. You can imagine, you can see all that open ground. And a, a member of the 11th Alabama has a great quote where he remembers that the, the sun was fiercely hot and there was no shade or other protection for the men. Uh, here they were, here they sweltered and swore as they were kind of waiting for the day's action to begin. But then, as I said before, eventually they do advance. Wilcox talked in his report about how the ground rises towards the Emmitsburg Road. You can clearly see that if you go out there today. Here's the Daniel Klingel farm as Wilcox's guys are approaching it. And Wilcox added that the fence being crossed, my men advanced to the road in which the infantry's line of battle was formed. A brisk musketry fight for a few minutes followed when the enemy gave way. So Wilcox tells us there is a fight. The two sides do exchange fire at the Emmitsburg Road. And at least according to Wilcox's report, the enemy gives way, Carr's brigade gives way relatively quickly. The other thing though we should add is he is getting hit with artillery fire, primarily from Seeley's battery. And you know, there's, a, um, a, there's an account where basically Wilcox climbs a fence, he gets off his horse and he climbs a fence and he's trying to look to see what he can see. And there's some canister rounds going by, but there's a funny story where there had been a young man in one of the uh, Alabama regiments who had been earlier um, disciplined. He had been in the wagon, he had been a wagon master and he had been disciplined by Wilcox for stealing chickens. And I guess Wilcox kind of said, well, okay, if, you know, if you're man enough to steal chickens, you're man enough to pick up a gun and go fight and join one of the regiments. So as Wilcox is standing on the fence, kind of looking at what's going around, this kid shows up with like 12 Yankee prisoners. And he presents the prisoners to Wilcox and says, here are your chickens, General. So yeah, I always thought that was kind of a uh, kind of a funny story. And we can only imagine how old Billy Fixon reacted to uh, to that. So with Wilcox approaching the Emmitsburg Road, let's go back to the 11th New Jersey for a minute because they're kind of going to get it from both sides. You've got Wilcox coming at us here and you've got Barksdale's guys uh, also coming coming at the left. Um, now there are, I know we have some friends who are very much into the 11th New Jersey. Again, I'm not sure if Bill Trelease is on the call tonight. Uh, Jim Lamison, I know guys like that who are really into the 11th New Jersey. I'm not going to spend the whole night talking about them, but I wanted to make sure they get their due because it's it's really some fierce fighting. Uh, Colonel Robert McAllister will order his soldiers to fire by the rear by rank, rear rank first, so that we can try to hold the enemy in check. Uh, so basically, they unleash with a volley. They open. Uh, open fire, but pretty quickly, Colonel McAllister is going to be wounded by a mini ball uh, in the leg, and then he's going to hit by a shell on the right foot. He's going to be carried to the rear, uh, but will survive his wounds. At about the same time, Major Phil Carney, uh, who is a cousin, or as we like to say on the podcast, a kinsman of the more famous general, uh, Major Carney says, you know, he's all excited. He says, I tell you, we're going to have a fight. Uh, no sooner does he say that when a Confederate bullet tears into his knee. And according to the account, he spun like a top to the rear, landing at least 10 feet away. Well, that was the end of Kearney and uh, Kearney and he uh, uh, died on August 9th. So now we're going to put Captain Luther Martin in command. However, Martin is going to soon be struck in the foot. And then while he's going to the rear, he's mortally wounded, which is going to turn command over to another guy, Captain Andrew Ackerman. But he's going to be killed just as he's being informed that the regiment is his, which now turns us over to Captain William Lloyd, who will take charge until he's wounded. So you've had one, two, three, four, five senior officers go down in relatively short period, command of the regiment turn over four times. Finally, the adjutant, Lieutenant uh, Schoonover is gonna have to take command. And as he wrote later, the fire of the enemy was perfectly terrific. Men were falling on every side. It seemed as if but a few minutes would elapse before the entire line would be shot down. And yet the galling fire was returned with equal vigor. So I imagine the 11th New Jersey has given it to these guys uh, pretty good. This probably took place over no more than 30 minutes. And when the uh, regiment had to fall back, they suffered what we estimate to be about 56 percent 
percent casualties, which will turn out to be the second highest in Humphrey's division when the day is over. So wanted to make sure we give the 11th New Jersey their credit. I know we've got some uh, or we may have some fans in the audience tonight. Here's a view on the battlefield. Their monument today is just south of the uh, Klingel House. So in the top picture on the front left, this is what it would have been looking like towards Barksdale's advance. You see the monument to Seeley's battery down here next to them. And then down at the bottom again would be the view towards Wilcox. So this is where, again, they would have been getting it from both sides. And this is what it looks like on the field. Uh, if you've never stood at the Daniel Klingel property and looked at these monuments, I would encourage you to do that. A lot of times when I do my sickles tours and I take people over to the Klingel property, you know, I'll have people who've been to the battlefield many times, but a lot of times they'll say, I've never been here, I've never stood here, and I've never gotten this view. And one of the things I want to do tonight is give you an appreciation for this. So if you haven't done that, you know, wink, wink, hire a battlefield guide who'll show it to you, but you know, you can certainly do it yourself. And the other thing you can do to kind of use this on the field is, um, you know, we talked about them kind of pivoting to the left and extending the line with the Excelsior Brigade. And you can kind of see that when you look at the field today. Uh, the 11th New Jersey Monument is here on the left. We got a blue arrow representing where the line would be pivoting back in that direction towards the Excelsior Monument of the 120th New York. So you can almost, when you go on the field today with your mind's eye, you can almost envision that line line uh, falling back with the red line here again representing Barksdale's onslaught. Which then brings us to the performance of the Excelsior Brigade. And, you know, they've always been sort of, they've always kind of gotten a knock here for some allegedly performing poorly uh, during this action. Um, I love Harry fans, but I think Harry fans is responsible for a lot of that. Fans kind of speculates in his book that because the Excelsiors didn't write a lot about this action, that they must have performed poorly and been embarrassed by their performance, which, you know, I'm not sure how I, uh, how I feel about that. I mean, a lot of Confederates didn't write about what they did at Gettysburg either, and we don't accuse all of them of poor performance. Um, Brewster talks about the enemy advanced upon us in great force, pouring a most terrific fire of artillery and musketry upon our front and left. We returned turned the fire with great effect, but we were obliged to fall back, which was done in good order, but with terrible loss of both men and officers. And if I didn't mention it before, I'll mention, remember too, these guys are also handicapped because they're going to have Graham's men fleeing into their ranks as Graham's guys are, and Bernie's guys are falling back from the peach orchard. So you got guys fleeing into their ranks, breaking up the Excelsior's line, saying stuff like, run boys, you know, we're whipped, the day is long lost kind of stuff. Um, so that's going to make it even harder for the, um, for the Excelsiors to hold their lines. Most people think the 120th New York probably gave the best performance of the bunch. They write about the enemy broke the first line. We advanced to meet them. We became hotly engaged and we held our position until we were flanked. And one officer said that within 15 minutes, about half of our regiment was either killed or wounded. And so you go back to the casualties of the Excelsior Brigade. Uh, I'm not saying they were the best troops on the field, but I was standing in the old Visitor Center Museum one time and listening to a guy tell his friends how they were the worst brigade in the Army of the Potomac. And I'm kind of thinking, really? I don't know. Maybe they were. Maybe they weren't. But ultimately, their overall 42% casualty rate uh, holds right up there with the casualty rate for, uh, you know, many of the more storied brigades in the Army of the Potomac. Uh, and I'll compare them to Strong Vincent's 26% brigade losses suffered on Little Round Top. So I'm not trying to bash Strong Vincent here, but I'm trying to show you that these guys, you know, were in the thick of the fighting and, you know, they put up some uh, some numbers to show it. So I think their numbers are comparable to, uh, to any brigade in the Army. Here's what it might look like at ground level. Again, at the 120th New York Monument, you can kind of imagine, you know, the line of blue here in the foreground, Barksdale's guys coming at us, but eventually, despite what I just said on the previous slide, eventually the Excelsiors do have to fall back and are overwhelmed and are gonna to start to retreat towards Cemetery Ridge. 
One of the things all the Union guys talk about in their accounts is the role of Confederate artillery and how the artillery seemed to be sweeping the ground with projectiles as the Excelsiors and then Carr's brigades were retreating towards Cemetery Ridge. Now, I think the day started off well. I think Turnbull and Seeley had kind of overwhelmed Patterson's battery on Warfield Ridge, Seminary Ridge, Warfield Ridge. I think they had overwhelmed Patterson early in the day, but as things were going to hell on the, um, uh, on the infantry side of the fence, and they kind of had to turn their attention towards some breaking up some of these infantry formations, I think what you get is you get some of Porter Alexander's batteries, and I'm talking about guys like Gilbert and Moody and Taylor and Parker, you get some of these guys, I think, first of all, sending over shots into Humphrey's line. And then later on, after the Peach Orchard falls, you've got Porter Alexander literally bringing guns up into the Peach Orchard and the Emmitsburg Road itself. So, you know, Alexander talks about in one of his many accounts, you know, the time we had throwing shells into Sickles's retreating troops. And I think some of that, some of these guns going into the Peach Orchard and the Emmitsburg Road, which I've kind of diagrammed here on the map, are some of the accounts that uh, the Union soldiers will remember afterwards. Seely said basically, you know, that after the retiring Third Corps infantry had cleared our path, we opened with good effect on the enemy, hitting Barksdale's guys, maybe hitting some of Wilcox's guys with canister. Uh, General Humphreys later said that the firing of Seely's battery was splendid and excited my admiration, as well as that of every officer who beheld it. Now, I'm not a big artillery guy, and this might be a good example of so what. So you have an example here of everybody talking about how well Seeley and Turnbull do uh, in throwing canister at the advancing Confederates, but it's clearly not enough. Two batteries out here are clearly not enough to basically break up the attack of these three infantry brigades that are now coming at us. Um, eventually, Seeley is going to be wounded and have to be carried off the field, and as he would remember, that while being carried over the ground on the open plain, I observed that the ground was completely scoured by the projectiles from Confederate artillery. Shells were screaming through the air, bursting in every direction. Um, eventually, Lieutenant Robert James is going to take command of the battery. He's going to fire a few more rounds of canister before they're basically forced to withdraw from the field. The men of the nearby 5th New Jersey are going to decide to help them out, and they're going to remove themselves from the field too. And so what you see now is you start to see Humphrey's defenses falling apart. Lang tells us that at about six o'clock, he's advancing towards what would be Turnbull's battery on the north side of the Klingel House. Uh, I moved forward. I was met at the crest of the first hill with a murderous fire of grape and canister. Uh, one officer nearby uh, basically is struck with a canister round that tears a big hole in him, uh, and he sank to the ground. So as I said on the last side, clearly the, artil the Union artillery is doing some damage here, but it's just not enough to slow them down. Uh, they're going to continue at the double quick. They're going to continue to drive the Federals back from the Emmitsburg Road. Lang later reported that we uh, thickly strewed the ground with their killed and wounded. This threw them into confusion, and when we charged them with a yell, they broke and fled in confusion into the woods and the breastworks beyond. And lying later afterward, I do not remember seeing anywhere before the dead lying thicker where the Yankee infantry attempted to make a stand in our front. So it might be a little bit lopsided, but clearly this is a heavy fight uh, going on here. Turnbull is also going to be ordered save his guns, pull his battery off the field. Uh, he is going to hit him with some canister as he retires by prolonged. Uh, but eventually, when they reach the swale, kind of the plum run swale at the base of the slope, by Humphrey's orders, Turnbull's men are going to pull out and abandon their guns on the field. So for a short time, uh, Turnbull's guns are going to be left on the field, although they'll be recovered later. 
Okay. Now for the infantry, um, you know, I wasn't going to tell this story tonight. I kind of had enough material anyways. And if there's one thing that people talk about on this part of the field, it's always Josephine Miller, uh, the Roger's niece, or I've lately heard her described as Roger's granddaughter. But in any ways, many of us know the story. She's in the Roger's house. She's reportedly baking bread for the soldiers during the engagement. Uh, Henry Blake, who I introduced you to earlier, describes here is a lady in the college or in the cottage who was baking bread and selling chickens. So she might actually be doing a little bit of business here, you know, selling chickens, which is at least how he described it. But Blake, if you've ever read Blake's book, and who hasn't, right? If you've ever read Blake's book, uh, he seems to have never met a man that he liked. Um, he doesn't have kind words for for uh, Rogers. He talks about a male occupant of the house who was trembling with fear for hours in this refuge, while the woman, presumably Josephine, refused to leave the house. Um, eventually, though, they did finally order her into the cellar where she took cover with um, the trembling, fearful man of the house. Um, again, the image here, probably most most of you know it is from the 1886 dedication of the nearby First Massachusetts. Uh, the veterans paid her expenses. She was at that time living in Ohio, paid her expenses from Ohio to Gettysburg to attend the reunion with the veterans, and they presented her with a gold badge of honor uh, to thank her for her service in baking bread for the guys. So I said I wasn't going to do that story because everyone does it, but then I kind of figured to be a completist, I might as well do it too. Okay, so now Carr is going to order the retreat from the Emmitsburg road and it doesn't seem to be all that well managed uh back to henry blake he says an order came from a blockhead upon the muster roll as a brigadier general to withhold their fire and to fall back blake excused the order the error on the grounds that this general was too far in the rear to clearly see this state of affairs Okay, now you can kind of say maybe Henry Blake has just got a bad attitude, uh, but Lieutenant Colonel Clark Baldwin of the 1st Massachusetts, he also writes something similar. He says as his 1st Massachusetts is ordered to fall back from the skirmish line, uh, they are ordered to reform in front of another unit, the 26th Pennsylvania. Well, this is going to block the 26 PA's fields of fire. And, you know, Baldwin kind of said, this has got to be a mistake. Who ordered this? And the staff officer says those orders came from General Carr. So for a while, the first Massachusetts is going to reform in front of the 26 PA. And just as they're doing that, Lang's men are going to come around the Rogers house and outflank their right. I'm uh, going to pour a terrible volley into the Union ranks. Further down the line, an officer in the 12th New Hampshire, a captain is instructed to shout the retreat orders into the ears of every company commander. Let them watch the motion of your sword as a single for its execution. So it's so loud with the gunfire and the artillery and men shouting and horses screaming that, you know, we have to kind of watch for the signal of the sword to, uh, to signal the, uh, the retreat. One man remembered screeches and yells mingling with the volleys of musketry pressing on against a storm of canister and mini balls, blinding the opposite side of the highway with the wounded and the dead. And that's going to be basically be a description, a type of description you'll see from these guys a lot. Which now brings us back to General Humphreys. With his flanks in the air, with his line being destroyed, with Confederate artillery shells sweeping the ground, Humphreys would say that my men being the only troops in the field, the enemy's attention was directed to my division, which I forced back slowly, firing as they went. Seely, before he left the field, said Humphreys was in the middle of the tornado, bareheaded and unattended, endeavoring to rally the retreating infantry of the Third Corps. Um, another guy says, you know, Humphreys could not hold his men. Uh, you know, they broke and they retreated. And the confusion, though, was momentary. For although disrupted and in disorder, they had a soldier for a leader. And they were soldiers themselves, and they almost immediately rallied. And perhaps the most famous quote of all comes from Humphreys himself, who refused to retreat at the double quick before the enemy. 20 times did I bring my men to a halt and about face to return fire to the Confederates, forcing the men to do it. 
20 times I brought my men to a halt. So you might say, well, geez, 20 times sounds like an exaggeration. And frankly, for years, I kind of thought the same thing too. But if you kind of look at probably the general direction of Humphrey's retreat, uh, which would presumably be to the northeast towards uh, Cemetery Ridge, at some points, you know, depending on where these guys were on the lines, some of them might have as much as, as a thousand yards to go. Uh, and, you know, if you sort of just do some rough math on that, if you're really stopping 20 times, that would basically be at about 50 yard intervals. So, you know, half a football field, turn and fire, fall back, half a football field, turn and fire. If you do that, you can kind of make the math work uh, to 20 times. Now, whether that was still an exaggeration on Humphrey's part, clearly many, many, many accounts talk about this guy showed his stuff, that he was a hero, a leader, and a fighter who helped turn this in from being an utter route. And kind of an interesting thing happens that people never talk about is they get back to Cemetery Ridge. Um, of course, there's other things going on. His sickles has been carried off the field. Winfield Hancock comes in and kind of starts to take over the left. You know, we throw in Willard's Brigade. We throw in the first Minnesota. Eventually, Wilcox and Lang and Barksdale will be stopped. But there's a little sidebar that I always talk about that a lot of times people forget. And that's basically a lot of these Third Corps troops with others kind of rally, reform, and Humphreys leads kind of a ragtag counterattack that, you know, in some ways kind of ends the day on a positive note. Um, you know, when you think about that, we always think of this day as being an utter defeat for the Third Corps. But I feel like this is kind of one last moment of Humphreys, you know, kind of saying to the Confederates, you know, screw you. I'm not going to I'm not going to let let myself that be blown off the field like this. And I like that idea of Humphreys, you know, his hat is off. He's got the bandana around his head, maybe waving the sword and kind of charging back towards the Emmitsburg Road and helping to contribute to pushing the, uh, the Confederates back. Um, you know, and that's gonna kind of end the day for our intents and purposes on our part of the field. Um, you know, in terms of the historical significance of this, I would say that, you know, Lee and Longstreet with this action solidify their control of the Emmitsburg Road on this part of the field. And for those of you who've done peach orchard programs with me before, you know that basically what this means is it's gonna encourage Lee to continue the attack again on July 3rd. And that of course is a, uh, presentation for another time, but kind of tragically too on the Confederate side, Wilcox and Lang advancing on July 3rd during what we call Pickett's Charge are gonna to have to advance and fight over much of the same ground again, you know, which is kind of a shame for them. All right, so let's talk numbers, what happened here. Humphrey's division will ultimately uh, come in at about 2,100 casualties. So of the 4,900 who were on paper, uh, 2,100 casualties, that's a 43% casualty rate. That's the third highest numeric loss for any division in the Army of the Potomac, third highest. Now, in terms of casualty rates, it's a little bit further down into the middle of the pack, but third highest numeric loss. Cars Brigade and that front line along the Emmitsburg Road is going to get hit with 54% casualties, and Brewster's Brigade is going to go down with 42% casualties, as I said before. Clearly, these guys, you know, are in a tough fight and take heavy losses, Confederates, you know, as you guys all know, we can't really figure this out because a lot of this isn't reported by day. And as I said, Wilcox and Lang fight again on July 3rd. But Wilcox estimated that he suffered about 500 losses on July 2nd. And so if you do the math on that, that's about a 29% casualty rate. Lang, the Floridians, uh, we estimate about 340 of their losses were suffered on July 2nd. So that would give them a 45% casualty rate. And then ultimately, Barksdale's three regiments, which went on towards Cemetery Ridge before they were turned back, they come in with a 55% casualty rate. So casualty rates for every brigade involved here. But I do think ultimately the numbers do kind of show that Humphreys, although he fought back the best he could, you know, probably got worse than, than he gave. 
And the map here on the right, although I didn't talk about the Klingles tonight in the interest of time, uh, this is part of the famed Elliott burial map, which when we did the Peach Orchard book, Brad and I kind of superimposed over some modern landmarks. And if you look up towards the top right of the screen, you can see a representation of the dead. Union, Confederate, and horses that would have littered the ground in and around the Klingle farm uh, when Daniel Klingle and his family came back. Okay, so just a quick wrap up. Afterwards, uh, I think July 8th, Humphreys maybe had enough of serving in the Third Corps in the field. He took that offer after all to uh, become Meade's chief of staff. And as Humphreys later said, clearly his tenure under Sickles had soured for a time being some of his battlefield ambitions. Humphreys talked about my mortification. It's seeing men over me and commanding me who should have been far below has destroyed all my enthusiasm and I am indifferent. Had I been left alone, I should have maintained my position and inflicted severe losses on the enemy. It incenses me to think of it. Well, that's pretty strong language. And you can wonder who he's talking about when he says, seeing men over and commanding me who should have been far below me. You can wonder who he's talking about there. Uh, but he did still long for field command. He accepted the chief of staff only as temporary until I can get a command of a corps. Less than that, I cannot stand. So eventually he did have his eyes on the prize. And in November of 64, Humphreys gets his wish, he is given command of the second corps, which he will command from November 64 through the close of the war. Um, he will serve as the army's chief of engineers after the war. There's that science background again until his retirement in 1879. He dies in Washington in 1883. And, you know, it's kind of a, an epitaph here. You know, Humphreys, he was new to command of his division prior to the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, the men maybe didn't know him that well, maybe didn't like him all that much. Uh, again, you know, going back to my first couple slides, the guy seems like a little bit of an odd duck, but no doubt he's a fighter and a leader. And I think one soldier kind of summed it up who said he did not like Humphreys before the battle, but swore by him afterwards because he showed himself a hero and a leader. And so with the postscript here, I'm sure there's at least somebody in the audience who's expecting me to do something with Sickles tonight. Uh, you know, kind of like Mick Jagger in Satisfaction, I got to end with something related to Sickles. So, of course, uh, just as a reminder, as the families rebuilt, the Klingles rebuilt to an extent, you know, the Rogers did. Uh, Dan Sickles came back to uh, this part of the field many times in his post-war career. Uh, but the famed photo that I have on screen, which many of you may be familiar with, he used the Rogers House site as his headquarters uh, for the 1913 50th anniversary reunion. And so I will close with sickles at the Rogers House site, surrounded by veterans, many of the men who fought on this part of the field that day. And I will ask you, is that really the end? Question mark. And so, Fran, with that, I come in right at about an hour. Uh, I will turn it back over to you, and uh, I'll answer any questions, or I'll let my colleagues answer questions as well. All right, Jim, take a little breather. Um, guys, I've changed the Zoom thing a little bit. I need everybody to turn on your microphones and your videos for a second to see if it kills the feed. And, Jim, can you uh, give us the screen back? Yeah, sorry about that. Let me... Uh... Yeah, sure. and I got to tell you, um, I know you hear this all the time. That was probably the best explanation of that side of the field. Honest to God, I don't know how you, I don't know how you take all that information and make it understandable. So I need everybody to turn on your videos and mics. Do we get a signal check here next week? Um, Zoom to Gettysburg has to start somewhere, and it starts.